Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> and Michael. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to introduce uh, John Oxer. John Oxer, who's going to um, uh, do our presentation the, uh, um, uh, this afternoon, and I think everybody's interested in shooting stuff at the moon, so this should be great. John. <laughs> Here at LCA in Hobart, Marco Ostini, who is just down the front here, did a lightning talk asking for people who are interested in getting involved in a team going after the Google Lunar X Prize. And I was really surprised because I thought he was going to be you know, beaten to a pulp in the stampede of people wanting to help. And he wasn't. In the end, there were four of us. So there was Marco, obviously, Andy Jelmy, Lee Begg, and myself, who formed Lunar Numbat. And I thought that there would be a whole lot more people wanting to help out. I mean, everybody loves rockets, right? How many people went to Bidal's talk yesterday about rockets? Yeah. <laughs> that was really cool. And Keith, of course. Sorry, Keith. I mean, even my four-year-old son, well, he was four when this photo was taken, loves rockets. This is a tiny little Class C rocket, which is like one of these, and we were launching it in a park near our house. It had an Arduino-based telemetry package in it, so it was transmitting real-time data back from accelerometers to that laptop you see in the front all in a rocket that's about this big. So that was pretty cool. So even Thomas loves rockets, and yet we didn't really have all that many people involved. And um, it's made me wonder a little bit. And I think part of the problem is that it just seems unrealistic to get involved in that sort of activity. I mean, some, we're not talking about little Class C stuff here. We're talking about the Lunar Numbat, Google Lunar X Prize type level of activity. When you start talking about, hey, we're going to have a mission where we put a remote control rover on the moon, People go, yeah, right. And it just doesn't seem like you can get involved. So but the thing is that this is actually kind of a solved problem. I mean, how many people here were born after November 1970? That's a lot of people in the room. Okay, so before you were born, the Russians put a couple of these on the moon. This is Lunokhod 1, which went up in November 1970 drove around on the lunar surface for 322 Earth days, travelled 10.5 kilometres and sent back photos like this one. This was a photo looking back at the landing craft after it had driven off. And Lunokhod 2, which went up in 1973, uh, lasted, I think, four months, and it drove 37 kilometres. And this was 40 years ago. And it seems that not a lot that's been really exciting has happened since then. Now, of course, we've got the shuttle program, we've got all sorts of other things, but it still kind of feels incremental, and it feels very inaccessible. It feels like we can't really get involved with it. These are mega-scale projects that individual open source people can't really do much with. So, basically, I've been asking myself the question, what's stopping us? Why don't we have moon bases? Why can't I go to What If and find specials on you know, Tranquility Base, spare rooms, or something like that? We should be able to do that by now. Uh, and a few other people have been thinking the same. A couple of years ago, Google launched the Google Lunar X Prize, which is a 30 million US dollar prize to, as they say, encourage revolution through competition. It's to encourage the private sector to attempt things that previously were only the domain of the public sector and lots and lots of money and lots and lots of people. And what they've done is put up a prize with a, a total of 30,000, oh sorry, 30 million, 30,000 wouldn't get you far, a 30 million dollar um, pot consisting of a $20 million first prize for a team who can land a rover on the moon, row 500 metres, send back high definition video and still images by um, the end of 2012, I think it is. After that date, the prize decreases a little. The second place winner um, receives $5 million and then there's another $5 million available for bonus prizes if you complete extra requirements, like you manage to land near a site of historical interest, like say you land near the Apollo 11 site and you take a photo of it or something like that, it gets you extra prize money. And this has caused a flurry of activity and lots and lots of interesting things have been happening. There are something in the region of 20 teams now that have entered officially into the Google Lunar X Prize and are seriously working on putting a remote controlled rover on the moon in the next couple of years. And at this stage, there are probably about four teams that could all credibly do it within that time frame. They are well progressed with their plans. Everything looks like their engineering is sound. They have uh, good people involved. 
And there is a lot of potential here and lots of interesting stuff going on. One of those teams is White Label Space. And this is the team that Lunar Numbat is involved in. Um, there are a number of others as well. Um, White Label Space has a particular interest in open source in terms of trying to not just achieve the end result, but achieve it in a way that new technology is developed, people are able to become involved, and that technology becomes useful for other people. The idea is to lower the barrier to entry to space technology for everyone, not just to pull off some one-off mission and then have nothing happen after that. There are a couple of other teams as well that have similar ideals. Um, another very notable one is FredNet, and um, I think there is going to be some more spoken about them later in the conference, so that'll be really interesting to see. They are specifically taking a very open approach as well. The, the thing about white label space, I mean, when you start thinking about this, you think, okay, it's going to take squillions of dollars to achieve this. How do you monetize, or how do you get the money up front in order to get to the moon? Because even if you do manage to get there and you get the $20 million first prize, that's still probably not even going to cover the costs of getting there. So it's not as if you can do this and then be rolling in money and you know, retire for the rest of your life. The approach that White Label Space have taken, and this is reflected in their name, is that it's an unbranded mission. Their concept is we will put together all of the infrastructure in terms of the technology, the mission plan, the people, everything that needs to happen, and it's going to be like a white label, a no-name brand mission, waiting for someone to come along and say, I will give you a bajillion dollars and we'll put my name on there. Which sounds a little crazy. You think, okay, who's going to come up with a bit out of their advertising budget to fund a space mission? But it starts to make a bit more sense. If you look at some of the budgets spent by various companies. Look at Toyota, for example. Over $3 billion a year just on advertising. The blue lines in here are space agencies um, of various nationalities. So you can see, for example, JAXA in there is the Japanese space agency. And um, Sony, $1.7 billion or so they spent on advertising. Now, if you put this up against the proposed mission that, Luna, uh, that White Label Space have come up with, you think about the cost of that mission, and then we'll stick that in the graph as well. It barely even registers. And it's down there, for those of you that can't see it from the back. So like a couple of pixels along the bottom. The idea of running a $30 million mission to us as individuals seems ridiculous. But to a large corporation, for the amount of exposure they could get from this, it could be huge. Paul. <laughs> OK. The elephant in the room. Oh, no, no, we needed a bigger screen. <laughs> so this is not as far-fetched as it seems. And White Label Space has already been successful in attracting, I think, six sponsors. So there are a number of companies. The ones that have gone on board so far are either directly or indirectly related to the space industry, and they're providing services and products and things like that. But hopefully sometime soon there will be an announcement of a major sponsor. Okay, um, in December, the White Label Space team put out their, um, their preliminary mission concept. And this outlines the sequence of events, how they want to run their mission. So basically what I'm going to do is take you through the steps of what's going to happen over the next couple of years. Well, this is the, um, the outcome of the mission. And, um, and point out some of the ways that you can actually get involved. So the first stage, obviously, you've got to get out of Earth's gravity well. And that takes some pretty serious hardware. So this is a PSLV XL lift vehicle, which is an Indian uh, vehicle which has just ended operation in the last couple of years. And the proposed um, mission profile involves lifting into a geostationary transfer orbit using a PSLV XL. Now this thing is a pretty serious piece of hardware. It's rather large. Um, to put it on into perspective, so here's me and one of these little Class C rockets. Change the scale a bit, that's one of these lift vehicles. That's 44 metres high, weighs 320 tonnes at takeoff, and it can throw a couple of tonnes into Earth orbit. And so there are a couple of, um, a couple of options here. At the moment, the PSLV XL is the preferred lift platform, but there is also an option to use a Falcon 9, which is another even heavier lifter currently under development by SpaceX in Texas. And what you see in that particular picture is the trajectory of a, um, a direct moon intercept course. So the Falcon is a much bigger machine, and it can lift. Um, it can actually go straight into um, a lunar injection um, profile. So the way it would be done with the, um, the PSLV would be to 
use the PSLV to get into orbit, and then there is a Star 30 BP, which is a massive rocket engine strapped to the side of the payload or under the payload. And it then does the transfer from um, geostationary transfer orbit into a translunar injection phase, which is when it moves out of Earth orbit and heads off towards the moon. Now, there are two different ways the payload could be configured. The one on the left is using the PSLV, which is the preferred method. And this is a dedicated payload. So what you can see in the stack there is the little rover sitting right up the top, the tiny little thing. There is a landing craft. Below that is a big gray rocket motor. That's a Star 30 BP, which is the, um, the braking engine. Below that is another Star 30 BP, which is for the translunar injection phase. The other um, nose cone you see there, which the scale is not the same. The one on the right is actually quite a bit bigger. That's the nose cone of a Falcon 9. And in this configuration, because they can inject directly into um, a lunar approach, we don't need to do the translunar injection phase, so we can scrap one of the Star 30 BPs. And they could actually piggyback three Google Lunar X Prize teams into one nose cone and get them all into an injection, um, an injection path to the moon. So that's the, um, the fallback plan. And this is the stack as it would be used using the PSLV. OK, so what we're looking at here is a lot of very serious hardware, very serious money. And you're probably thinking, hmm, what can we do? How do you get involved in this sort of thing? This is really just a case of take a few tens of millions of dollars and throw it at a problem, and it gets fixed. And there's not really all that much scope up to this stage of the project for open source hackers or random individuals to get involved. But there are lots of really interesting things that come on after this point. It's really once you get into, um, into lunar orbit and then on approach for landing where we can start contributing. So this is the, um, the stack as it would be approaching the moon. It doesn't matter which profile is chosen. The end result is going to be a stack like this um, approaching the moon with the braking stage at the bottom, which would then separate and the orange lander, which is what actually comes down and touches down on the moon's surface. And this is where Lunar Numbat comes in. So Lunar Numbat, as I mentioned before, is a group of four people so far, plus um, a whole bunch of others who are interested in following what we're doing, but not necessarily getting involved on a regular basis, who are working with White Label Space to provide some of the little bits of technology that could be of interest to them. Now, one of the drivers for White Label Space, as I said earlier, is they want to not simply buy a whole bunch of off-the-shelf pieces, bolt them together, and come up with a mission. They really want to try to come up with some little new elements along the way. And this comes to one of the, uh, the big tensions in space technology between trying to avoid risk and trying to develop and improve things. Because changes always involve risk. And over the last few years, the space industry in general has become very risk-averse. No one wants to... Uh, be seen to have a mission that fails. Because not only does it cost lots and lots and lots of money, but it just makes you look bad. And um, actually, actually, if you look back at the really early Russian um, space program, they had stuff blowing up all the time. And their solution was they had a policy of, if it blows up, don't tell anyone. So as far as the West was concerned, their space program was you know, proceeding swimmingly. Every mission they had worked flawlessly. They didn't tell you about the cosmonauts they killed and the rockets that blew up on the pad and things like that. And so what we've ended up with is a culture which is extremely risk averse for a whole bunch of reasons. And um, so that's where um, Lunar Numbat and White Label Space can inject a little bit more life into it, I suppose. And um, this is one of the guys we're working with. This is Dr. Andrew Barton, who is the um, lead engineer for the lander. He previously worked at ESA, um, which is the European Space Agency, in their, um, oh, Marco, can you remind me of the term? Concurrent Development Lab, that's right. Uh, and so he's actually a space professional. And I should point out that there are a whole bunch of people in white label space who are space professionals. This is not just a bunch of uh, people who got together and thought, let's shoot stuff at the moon. They do this for a living. And um, he left ESA and is now working um, on white label space and uh, has been involved in a number of missions in the past. So. He's working on the lander, and uh, this is the lander, basically what it looks like as the rover is exiting. There are a couple of interesting aspects to this. Firstly, um, one of the things that we've been contributing to a little bit is the altimeter. There are all sorts of interesting technical problems, and this is the whole point of this talk. There's lots of stuff here that um, there, there are problems waiting to be solved. 
one obvious one is, how do you tell how high you are when you're trying to land on the moon? There's no GPS constellation. You can't measure air pressure. So really, the only feasible way to do it is some kind of a, reflect, a reflection system. And so um, Lee has been working on a radar altimeter, which basically is like echolocation. Sends a signal down, bounces back, and you see how long it takes. And um, there's some really interesting work being done on that. So if there are people that are into RF and like playing around with some really interesting things, and he's also been investigating the possibility of doing this using software-defined radio. Lots of interesting um, software problems in there to be solved if, you've, if you're that way inclined. So I'm sure Lee would love some help in that sort of area. Um, other stuff we've been doing is the throttle control. As the lander comes down, it's going to have, a, obviously, a big rocket engine, which is going to control its descent rate. And we need to be able to continuously variable, vary the, um, the throttle. Now, one thing you may not know is that a lot of landers that have been used in the past are actually extremely low tech. They're far more crude than you might imagine. Like we've got this concept that they're super high tech. Everything is really well uh, tuned, and they're remarkably not. There are a couple of, um, a few of the landers, for example, there was one I, um, I saw some specs on just recently. They wanted to vary, I think this was one of the Mars landers, they wanted to vary the thrust as it was coming into land. And they couldn't vary the, thru the thrust on the engines. All they could do was turn them on and off. So they stuck 16 engines on it, four on each side, and they just pulse width modulate them. So as the thing's coming down, the engines are turning on and off very fast, and it's shaking like crazy. And it worked, but obviously it's a bit of a brute force solution. It's fairly crude. And so we've been working with, um, with ASRI, actually, which is the Australian Space Research Institute, on their OSROC program. The, um, the next major rocket design that they're working on is OSROC 2.5. And that's what this throttle body is from. Um, what you can see here, up in this section here, the propellant basically throw, flows through here. This is a, um, a liquid oxygen kerosene-based propellant. And inside there is a ball joint um, throttle valve, which is continuously adjustable. There's a, um, a gear drive here. This is a, um, a servo motor, which I hate, but anyway. We're probably going to end up redesigning a little bit of this. But this is just one of the, um, the technical things that we're dealing with at the moment. So we've been playing around with um, control systems for how to control the position of the throttle, get feedback on the current throttle position and stuff like that. In the short term, what we're going to do is use this throttle body in OSROC 2.5, which is a 7.2 metre um, rocket that will go to 20 kilometres altitude, um, throwing about a 10 kilo payload. And just to give you some idea of how large it is compared to you know, these little toy things. This is one of the ASRI guys after he just finished welding up a stress testing rig um, so that he could measure uh, the displacement on a couple of the joints. So what you see there in that, um, that cylinder that's sitting there is the dimensions of the body of the rocket. So you know, this is a seriously big rocket. And um, in fact, I've got a little video somewhere of stress testing. This is time lapse. You can see someone walking past very fast. But this is the body of Osrock being twisted with huge force placed on it. And um, is, they're measuring the displacement of the body. So at the moment, they're at the stage of doing um, the structural engineering and testing of the, um, the main superstructure, while various other people are working on subsystems within it, like the, um, the throttle control system. And while playing around with this, the thing is that when, once you get a group of people together, like technically inclined people, you like solving problems and playing with rockets and electronics. They tend to do other things as well that are you know, peripherally related. And uh, this is one of the projects that we've just been working on, um, also as part of the Connected Community Hacker Space in Melbourne. This is the Arduino, um, Arduino Rocket Telemetry and Instrumentation System. So this is like a really super crude equivalent to Vidal and Keith's effort. Uh, but the idea with this was that it was to be very cheap and simple to assemble, and we could get up and running really easily and just do some really low-tech tests with it. So that was a rendered concept of what it was meant to look like, and the first handmade prototype actually looked like that. Not quite as neat, but it worked quite well. In fact, we flew that um, a couple of times, and, um, just because videos are fun. This was a... Which one was it? This was a launch we did um, just, 
well, it was December 29, so it was just before New Year's. So the white one you can see there is a little Class G rocket which is carrying the Artemis payload. Uh, to the right of it, you can probably barely see it, is a tiny little Class C, which is like one of these, which is carrying another payload, also based on an Arduino. And this was actually flown in an urban area. So <laughs> we had to use special rocket motors that um, had a very short burn time, so we didn't exceed the, um, the altitude limit. But we got telemetry back from these rockets, and um, that was really cool. So fun to play with. On, once the, um, the actual lander has touched down, obviously the important thing is to get the rover out and get some data back. And this is also where there are a couple of things that we can contribute. Um, Professor Kazuya um, Yoshida from um, Hokkaido University, I think it is, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, is the rover lead engineer. Um, how many people here have heard of the Japanese mission to intercept a meteor and return material from it? Cool. So here's one of the engineers from that mission, which launched in 2003, and um, he's now working on the rover for white label space. So obviously there are some very well qualified people involved in this. So this is one of the early, you know, just rough concepts of how the rover would look. And they've been doing um, fabrication, like materials testing, and doing some fabrication of some of the subsystems over in Japan over the last couple of months. Uh, these are some diagrams from some wheel traction testing they were doing. And uh, they've set themselves up a little traction testing environment. And they're doing, using different wheel designs. And they have a, a moon surface analog, essentially. It's the lunar regolith. And because, obviously, you're dealing with a hyper-arid environment and low gravity, there is um, very little binding between the material on the surface of the moon. And so traction is a real problem. It's like trying to drive through talcum powder or something. It's not as bad as on Mars, but it's still pretty bad. So they've been doing some, um, some testing where they drag the wheel across the surface and measure um, slip as it moves. So there's some interesting stuff happening with that. And uh, one, of the other thing, one of the other requirements of the rover is that it needs to be able to send back um, high-def video and still pictures and also low def. The requirement is that low def comes back in real time and high def comes back um, on a delayed basis. It's stored locally. But that raises an interesting problem, which is video compression, because we're talking about a very small device here. It doesn't have much processing power in it. And so um, Lee, once again, has been working on some image processing. And what he's done is come up with a, um, a compression, a method for compressing um, JPEG so this comes from a motion JPEG video stream, extremely fast. So with very, very little CPU overhead, he's able to take um, an image, a frame, so in this case 292K, and apply varying compression levels to it. And he can output um, a version at 2.2K, as you can see in the bottom right there, which obviously has a lot of image degradation, but it goes down to something like one point, no, it's less than that, it's like 0.7% of the original image size in pretty close to real time, and that's really, really impressive. So he's, at the moment, working on um, setting up some more proof of concept stuff on this. So he's got this working, obviously, with still images pulled from a, um, a motion JPEG stream, but there is lots more to do. And um, so I think there are some more videos I've got to show as well. Uh, actually, I've got to show you this one. Have to show something that'll outdo. Well, Do we have audio? Has anybody seen this one before? Yeah, a couple of people. We're striving to reuse our tree and find ways to more efficiently use our rocket engines. How was this idea conceived? Well, you might say it was immaculate. What is science's role in Christmas? How many little kids have calculated exactly the number of seconds that Santa would have to deliver presents down their chimney? Now, there are millions of kids out there who have probably done that math problem. And so, you know, we're just, we're just extending that. You can see All of the math going. was nothing exciting. It was just a little differential calculus. All of the Christmas tree dynamics have been worked out in rigorous detail. I expect the Christmas tree to launch to approximately 100 feet. 
then turn over and fall and land like a dart. I think that this just really goes to what it means to be an American at Christmas time. Well, the ignition system is really simple. We just have uh, 32 SD's D120 class engines, all wired in parallel with individual igniters. We're going to use a car battery to provide the power. Uh, it should be very instantaneous. All engines should fire within about 10 milliseconds of each other. Is it possible that the tree will explode on launch? I think that's a minimal chance. A reflection of my childhood? This Christmas tree is a mirror. I would say that this event goes beyond community oriented and, and really enters into the ground of, of nation building. No, I don't think astronauts have been given an adequate chance to celebrate Christmas in the past. Uh, this is really a tribute to them. The whole family can enjoy this experience. How does mom feel about it? Did you ask mom? <laughs> you can't. She's coming home. So, Bidale, do you think you could model the aerodynamics of a Christmas tree? <laughs> so, as you can see, there are lots of technical challenges to get involved with, and um, lots of things that we haven't necessarily even thought of, and we would love to have more people involved. So, there's the Lunar Numbat website, where there's a whole lot of information about some of the things that we're doing. One of the things that we haven't been so good at is putting up uh, documentation about our progress. So, there are lots of things that we've done that really haven't been put online. And it would be really cool if we had someone that could help with that, like someone that could do um, you know, updating the website, basically. But there are all sorts of other jobs that could be done as well. So if anyone would like to get involved, um, Marco, Andy, and Lee and I will all be out the back, and we can, we can find something for you to do, that's for sure. Uh, John. Yes. Um, how are you dealing with the fact that, I mean, using commodity um, components for, for hacking on, how are those going to work in a red hard environment? Okay. Um, what we're doing at the moment is just prototyping um, the architecture, and the idea is to replace parts with um, radiation-hardened parts as we go. So we're still in the very early stages of um, coming up with proof-of-concept solutions, really, and the idea is to then iterate through to um, something that is flight-ready. Actually, on the subject of radiation-hardened, it reminds me of a little story. Those lunar code rovers that um, I showed you right at the start one of the problems they knew they were going to face was because the lunar day and night are 14 days long, they couldn't keep them warm, and it goes very, very cold at night. And um, so to stop the lunar rovers freezing, they simply chucked some radioactive material in the middle of them. So those rovers are highly radioactive, which had the side effect that they had to make all of their electronics super hardened against radiation. And then many, many years later, when the Chernobyl disaster happened, they couldn't find anyone with the engineering experience to build robots to go in to, um, to do cleaning up. And they actually brought a couple of the Lunokhod um, engineers out of retirement. They dusted off the old Lunokhod plans and built um, variants of them to use as miniature remote control bulldozers. And they went into um, Chernobyl. Now, they were pretty much the only things that could survive in the area. Um, sorry, there's another comment. Yes. Um, I've, uh, I've done this sort of thing before, strangely enough. Um, <laughs> that doesn't surprise me. If anybody's heard of transorbital, uh, that was me trying hard and actually managing to get to orbit. Um, it's still up there, I think. Uh, one of the big problems we had uh, was getting everything through ITAR. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think you're going to launch by 2012, you ought to have started doing your ITAR stuff about a year ago. Yeah. Um, oh, Marco, it looks like you're eager to answer that one. Um, can we have a microphone, please? Thank you. Um, you'll find that that's what white label are on top of. So white label space have an extremely close working relationship with the European Space Agency. And um, as John mentioned, each of the members of white label space uh, do this for a day, day job. So they certainly are well aware of the uh, paperwork involved. And um, yeah, they're definitely in uh, processing all of that. The, the thing that's of um, particular interest, though, is that 
essentially there's this latent frustration that exists not just in the European Space Agency but certainly in other space science related organizations that they really want things to, uh, th they're looking for innovation. So while some of the uh, larger corporations have some serious doubts that any team will succeed with Google Lunar X Prize, it's amazing to see how many people within some of the actual space agencies themselves are really keen for it to succeed. So I think some of the regulatory problems certainly have been foreseen and they're being processed now, but I think uh, there's also the will to potentially help make them happen a bit quicker. Potentially. Right. As for 2012, let's wait and see. Two years is, as you say, not much time It's at not all. long when you're dealing with this sort of stuff. That's and right. There right. is the possibility that the successful team might be in 2013. But of the four teams that um, John alluded to, they're very serious about it, yes. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to chip in, just don't tell the wife. <laughs> 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 we can put you under a pseudonym. Uh, Paul. Um, yeah, good day. Just on the video compression, uh, about I think three or four years ago, I saw a uh, FPGA chip which was um, compressing uh, 640 by 480 uh, video down to OG files at 60 frames a second. Uh, cool. So, and as in, you know, at faster than real time. Yeah. So I'll give you more details, maybe. Okay. Later, but um, Lee's the that one would that would like those great. details. Um, one of the biggest problems with um, that sort of thing is that that sort of hardware, you just cannot get red hardened. Um, they're talking about just shielding commodity hardware anyway, um, if they can get it to a stage where it will actually still work. Um, the advantage of JPEG 2000 is we can compress it, the original images for high definition television level in real time in hardware and then in software we can cut it down to those very small sizes very very quickly um, with little processing power and also avoid sending the data twice so one of the cool things about JPEG 2000 you can just cut it off in the middle at a packet boundary within the frame and just send the send the first bit now and the last bit later and you get the whole the whole high quality piece which is actually a really helpful thing when you're bandwidth limited. Yep. And very long latency, obviously. Yes. And, 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 and look, the, the radiation hardening thing is both a whole lot easier and a whole lot harder than you think. The whole lot easier part is that folks building stuff in the amateur satellite community have been dealing with this for decades, and we've flown a lot of stuff very successfully. And there's some fairly simple rules that you can follow for component selection that will help you to avoid you know, picking things that are going to be particularly problematic. The, 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 the potentially very difficult um, and frustrating part is that those rules will cause you to eliminate almost all modern, you know, simple high integration microcontrollers. And so the notion that you can take, you know, a PIC or an AVR or something and without lots and lots of, you know, thought about what the trade-offs and issues are, expect to fly something like that, you, you, you have to be, you know, sanguine about the probability of that working. But the, the sort of, while there are lots of things we don't understand yet about um, the radiation environment of space, there's an awful lot that we do understand, and people have built and flown things using um, non-explicitly rad hard parts, and those things have gone on to have multiple decades of useful lifespan. So this, this is not nearly as, as crazy as you think it is, but it, it is tough because a lot of the parts you'd like to use you just can't. You just can't because yeah. they won't work. They've got dynamic configuration cells, and they'll take you know high energy particle hits, and all of a sudden the bits have flipped, and yeah. it doesn't work at all the way you thought it would. So, John, yes, over, over this side, over there. Sorry, wouldn't it be like quicker and cheaper just to take the approach that the Americans did with the moon landing and, and fake it? <laughs> <laughs> So I need to amend this list a little. What I need are special effects artists. Um, hang on. Paul's got the microphone just back up here. Um, yeah, just an encouragement to everyone else. Um, I had a go at putting some stuff together in Perl for tracking trajectories, um, just as a proof of concept. And out of the woodwork, well, I'm not sure if he's involved to start with, but um, someone came up with... Um, 
another Perl program with all the tweaks and um, oh, what do you call it? Orbital mechanics. The orbital mechanic stuff, yep. and I learned a whole bunch just from um, studying what he'd done. Uh, where did the guy come from? University of Queensland. Right. Right. And it was, um, it was fantastic because all of a sudden I found out a whole lot more that I wouldn't have found out if I hadn't have started looking at it in the first place. Yeah. So as I said, there are lots of technical challenges here. And um, from a geek's point of view, it's paradise because you get to learn all sorts of things that you'd, you'd never expect. John. Yes. Whoa. Whoa. Put your hand up, please. I can't see where that is. <laughs> um, are you at all concerned that in the event you have to use the shared payload that maybe you should be including some kind of defence systems against the <laughs> other teams. <laughs> we were actually just talking about that a couple of days ago. We're thinking about a rover arm that could extend down below the payload or something and, yeah, add some pyrotechnics to it. Um, no, that's, <laughs> that's not personally an issue I have to deal with. Um, it's one of those things where... Uh, Marco can probably answer this one better once again, but um, if a number of teams end up landing at the same time. I'm not quite sure how the decision would be made as to who is the winner, um, whoever deploys faster or lands sooner or whatever. Um, but it's one of the good things about this is that to some extent there is a bit of cooperation between teams. And if it ends up in a situation where three teams can put in some money and cover the cost of a Falcon 9 when none of them could get there on their own, then that's a good thing for everyone involved. Vic. <laughs> oh, g'day. Oh, uh, please, yes. How are you? Uh, if someone else beats you and then the second prize goes and the third prize goes, you guys are still going to keep going, right? Yes. Um, the thing to remember here is that, as I said, even if you do win the prize, it probably wouldn't even cover the cost of getting there. So that's not the payoff. The payoff is then what happens later with other uh, missions that can follow on from it. Uh, for example, I know that White Label Space already has... Um, very preliminary plans for subsequent missions. Um, I know that there are plans in place by some other XPRIZE teams for interplanetary missions if all of this comes off. So the idea is that this is something that will jumpstart an industry that um, will hopefully have a financial imperative, not just doing it for the hell of it. Uh, just uh, Vic, a, you had yeah. another question. Uh, well, it was just a, a little point about, um, about crapping on the payload below you. Um, for some reason, the uh, people who launch these things are, are very, very fussy about how much activity you have in your payload before <laughs> launch. And they don't very much like the idea of EMP, lasers, thermite, that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah. Easter eggs are not really part of the mission plan. Um, yep. Uh, Marco, did you have a response? Yeah, okay. Marco first and then question. Just with regards to the whole idea of why the Google InterX prize exists, um, there was a, a prize uh, for the first person to fly across the Atlantic, and it was Lindbergh, I believe, who won. Prior to that, people didn't believe you could fly an aircraft, aircraft across the Atlantic. And after he won, like uh, within years afterwards, maybe five or so years, there were commercial flights. And hundreds, then thousands of people were flying across the Atlantic, and now we don't even think twice about it. And the whole problem is mostly in our heads. It's really a misconception. It's mostly that we think, well, it can't be done because it's not being done. And really, that's the wrong way around. It's like um, personal computers would not have come around if uh, you know, everyone was waiting for IBM to make them. It wouldn't have happened. Instead, it was just a bunch of kids who wanted to innovate, and they just wanted to do it for fun. And essentially, this is exactly how some of the innovation needs to happen in space science as well. To uh, put one slight other spin on it, this isn't the only X Prize. The first X Prize was, mm. was the Ansari X Prize, which was won by Scale Composites. And their technology has now gone on to be the foundation for Virgin Galactic, which, will be, uh, which is a uh, commercial entity. So the technologies that will come about through the Google Lunar X Prize will certainly have commercial applications later. Yeah, um, I think someone else had a question. Yeah, uh, uh, my question is, uh, it's more of a ORAF question. Have you considered using um, visual as opposed to ORAF when you're landing the vehicle? For range finding? Yeah. 
Um, I haven't been directly involved in that sort of that part of the decision process. Uh, Lee can answer that. Um, doing it visually is not as accurate. Um, there will be a down-facing camera to determine the movement relative, to, uh, perpendicular to the surface, so we can tell if we're moving across it. Um, but vertically, which is the most critical dimension, is um, has to be reasonably accurate. We're looking at about, I think it's two or three percent, down to about two metres, and from about uh, two metre accuracy above 150, um, which is close enough. The, Moon's gravity isn't that great. You can drop from two metres and not do much damage. Um, so there's definitely a camera, and that will actually be coming back in near real time as well. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, there's still a light speed delay, or not as an RF delay, yeah. Is there a reason you're not using no. the uh, Armadillo lander? Uh, sorry, what was that? Is there a reason you're not using the Armadillo or Mastin landers that both recently won? Um, I don't know. Um, <laughs> this is the difficult thing about doing this particular talk, is that what I'm covering is work done by a whole bunch of other people. Uh, the mission profile that came out in December, um, that was the first time that we'd actually seen the, um, the specified um, lift vehicle and various other things like that. So I'm not sure on what basis White Label Space made that decision. Um, do you have any insight into that, Marco? Yes, the reason why is because the Japanese want to be in. They want to play the game. That's the reason why. So they've put, as you can see already, quite a lot of effort into designing a lander that they think will be the most efficient. The scales, if I'm not mistaken, are slightly different as well. So um, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with the um, other teams, the uh, Carnegie Mellon team and um, uh, Odyssey, but uh, some of their landers are of a different scale. Ultimately, <laughs> basically, the greater the scale, the more it's going to cost to get there. And... Um, uh, what the Japanese are working on with white label space uh, essentially fits the profile of what they have in mind to launch with uh, either a Falcon 9 or the PSLV. PSLV. Mm. Yeah, just to underscore that, basically the difference in approach is if you look at some of the landers proposed by the teams, it's like the difference between a little remote control car and a Humvee. It's amazing. Some of the things that they want to put up there, you just wonder, hmm, okay. Mike. What about the laptops they were using on the uh, the um, International Space Station, the Russian Space Station? They ran. <laughs> Peter, are you going to answer that one? I'm well, just wondering. I mean, they, they ran. So obviously it can't be that bad. Yes, it is. Those are underneath the Van Allen belts. When you're on the moon, you're not. Zappity zap. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think we're pretty much out of time. Do we have time for one more question? Yep, yep one more. Who's lucky last? No. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Make sure you go there. Oh, yes, I should just point out, if people are wanting to talk to us about this, rather than mob us up on the stage and um, prevent anybody else coming for the next talk, we'll be just out the back. <laughs>